Good evening once again. It's good to be able to share God's word together and have fellowship that way, even although we can't actually meet together. I want to start with the second section of the book of Job. We've dealt with the first chapter, which represents the first section. We're now going to have a look at chapters two and three, and we're going to focus on what I've termed the four voices that we hear speaking in these three chapters. We're going to deal with chapters two and three and have a look at what I've termed the four, four voices that we hear in, in these chapters. Now, the first voice is the voice of the accuser. And we find that in the first eight verses of Job 2. So let's just read that together. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds his integrity, fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome, loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And the Hebrew tells us that that was at the dung hill. So here's the voice of the accuser. First of all, we find that Satan doesn't give up very easily. And this is something that we need to remember at all times. Don't, don't think that because you defeat him once, that he's not going to come back. He will. We see this in the temptation of Jesus. There he was defeated four times consecutively in a row. But after the first defeat, he came back a second time. And after the second defeat, he came back a third time. And after the third defeat, he came back the fourth time. And every time, he kept coming back. And this is true of Satan in the presence of God when it comes to Job. First of all, he appears to God with that first accusation. And now he comes back and appears before God with, uh, with new accusations. He says skin for skin. We are not sure what this really means, but we know that Satan was asking permission to afflict Job physically. Some people believe that the skin for skin was a reference to the skin of an animal to save one's own skin. In other words, you sacrificed an animal to the Lord so that your skin might be preserved and and uh, uh, and so it's it's obvious when when Satan speaks about this that he's speaking about his life and God is also speaking about this but the thing that God gives Satan permission is to afflict Job physically now Satan's objective stayed exactly the same to get Job to cease his worship of God and to get him to curse God instead. That's the direction that he was trying to move in. And Satan's affliction of Job's body was incredibly intense. Now, here are some of the symptoms that we find listed in this, in this book of, um, of Job. Now, we're going to have a look at these symptoms specifically, but I just want to say, we don't have a name for this disease, whatever it is. Some have suggested smallpox. Some may have suggested elephantitis, and I don't know what that is, and I don't know how they get there. I know that one doctor that I know personally 
uh, when he read through all the study that I had done and, and he listened to it and he, he had a look at all these particular symptoms, he came up with suggest a suggestion that it might be one of the uh, Pym uh, figus diseases. That's a, a group of diseases that belong to the autoimmune deficiency group and it's a, a disease that affects the flesh and the skin. And uh, he actually suggested that it might even be one specific kind, and that's polyacheus. But I, I don't know, and I'm not a medical expert, and I'm not prepared to comment on this. But what I do know is that the two Hebrew words that are used here to describe the skin problem that he has are the same words that are used to describe the sixth plague in Egypt. And this is what we read in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become a fine dust over the, all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on, a, on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. Now those boils that break out as sores, they're the same words that we find used in, in Job, and they're used over here in, in Exodus as well to describe what was happening. And um, we, find the, we, we find that the, the same words are used in the disease that afflicted Hezekiah. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 to 7, we read this. Turn back. That's God speaking to Isaiah. You remember the context Isaiah had come and given Hezekiah the message that he must get his house in order because the sickness that he has, this boil that had, that had burst out on his skin and weakened him and made him incredibly ill. Um, and Isaiah came and said, you're not going to recover. This is terminal, my friend. And as Isaiah walked out from his presence, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he cried to the Lord and he just humbled himself and asked for God's mercy. And God speaks to Isaiah before he leaves the, 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 the palace precinct and says, go back. And uh, he says, turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Isn't that amazing? As this guy just gets a message, he's going to die. He humbles himself. The Lord immediately sends a prophet back and says, Hey, I've heard this guy's prayer and I've changed my mind. I've seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And then in verse 7, we read this. And Isaiah said, bring a cake of figs and let them take uh, uh, and let them take and lay it on the boil that he may recover. So they make a poultice of this cake of frig, figs and they lay it on the boil. Um, and that boil is the same Hebrew word, what, whatever it might mean. We, we don't really know. Uh, as I've mentioned before, Job is one of is probably the oldest book in the Bible, and it uh, it was first written. But let's have a look at some of these symptoms that are mentioned in this book. First of all, we are told in, in chapter 2, verse 7, that he had inflamed ulcerous sores on his skin. Verse 8, um, it was itching. And uh, in, in verses 7 and 12, we are told that degenerative changes in facial skin took place. And then in chapter 3 and verse 24, we're told that he had a loss of appetite. Um, and in chapter 3, verse 24, we're told that he suffered from depression. Um, in chapter 6 and verse 11, that he experienced a loss of strength. There was a weakness that came with this disease that he had, or combination of diseases uh, could be as well. And then in chapter 7 and verse 5, Worms appeared in these boils that he had all over his skin. And, and also we are told in that same verse that he had these running sores. In chapter 9 and verse 18, he tells, tells us that he, he developed difficulty in breathing. And in chapter 16, verse 16, there was darkness under the eyes. He developed these dark rings. In chapter 19, verse 17, 
He tells us that he developed foul breath. In chapter 19 and verse 20, he tells us about his weight loss. In chapter 30 and verse 17, he tells us that he had continual pain. And in verse 27 of chapter 30, that there was a restlessness about him. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't relax. In chapter 30 verse, um, and verse 30, he tells us about the blackening of his skin. And in that same verse that his skin started peeling off. And in the same verse of the fever that he experienced at that time. We might not know exactly what this disease represents, but what we do understand from these symptoms is that Job's physical suffering was intense and that Satan was about it, uh, behind it. Now, in the New Testament, demonic forces, we are told, are often behind physical problems that people had. Here are some of the conditions attributed to demonic activity in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22, we are told that there was a man who was blind because of demonic forces. In Matthew chapter 9 and verses 32 to 33, we read about a man who lost the power of speech. He was dumb because of demonic forces. We read about physical deformities. In Luke chapter 13, verses 11 to 17, incessant pain. This was Paul's experience. He talks about this messenger, this angel of Satan that was given to buffet him, to punch him, and to cause this incessant pain. And that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And then again, um, in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28 to 34, we read about this young boy that was insane. Um, and that was caused by demonic oppression. So, not all natural sicknesses and illnesses and conditions we have are caused by demonic powers and other spiritual things. Some of them are a natural result of a carelessness on our part, and we have nobody to blame but ourselves. But there are times when our problems and our physical diseases are caused by these invisible little microbes, bacteria and, and viruses and various other um, uh, organisms that, that can make us ill. But even... Um, but there are times when it is a direct result of demonic activity. But even when it's just natural causes, and even when it's our own carelessness, I think that we need to understand that Satan knows exactly how to use our folly and to and, and or our illnesses to further his particular cause. The second voice I want to mention this morning is the voice of ad adversary. And that we read of in chapters in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And this is what we read. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Notice that last part of that verse. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when we look at the Job's wife, who becomes this voice of the adversary, I, I just want to point out, we know very little about Job's wife, except that, in my opinion, she's been badly spoken of by preachers and commentators. I remember reading a book some years ago. It was a fictional book about the life of Job, and I really didn't enjoy it. And one of the things I didn't enjoy about it was that this lady that wrote it turned Job's wife into a really horrible person who, when Job was afflicted in this way and went to go and sit on the ash heap, um, the dung hill outside town where they took all the rubbish and used to burn it there, and he was sitting there on the ashes of of this dung and, and rubbish that was continually being burnt there, she went and moved in with his adversary, the guy that was his enemy and the chap that was rejoicing in the fact that he'd come tumbling down. The man had always been in competition with Job. And uh, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that she was a sinful woman. I don't believe that she was an adulteress because the Bible tells us that and as far as we know, she stayed with Job all the way through this. 
and eventually produced another 10 children for him. He didn't take another wife. He stayed with the same wife that he had. And so when we see this little outburst when, he, when she says to him, curse God and die. And, and of course, we recognize that that's exactly what Satan wanted Job to do. And Job's wife put this temptation before her husband. Now, I want to stress that Satan can work through the people who are dear to us. And the temptation sometimes then becomes stronger because we love them so much. And when we look through, especially the Old Testament, we see that Satan knows how to use wives and often did. For example, Adam listened to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 11. Abraham listened to Sarah when it came to taking her maidservant and, and having sexual relations with her and producing um, Ishmael the son that wasn't of promise. And we read of that in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Uh, I must say, just in passing, that um, Sarah didn't have to twist Abram's arm very much. <laughs> and uh, maybe it was just because this was a much younger lady. And uh, I, I don't know what it is. But anyway, he listened to his wife instead of listening to the Lord. We also read in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, that Solomon was influenced by his wives. And we we're actually told that he turned away from the Lord because of the influence of the wives that he had. And of course, he had a, a whole lot of them, and maybe that was the big problem. But we also told that Ahab listened to Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and, and 31. He married this woman, and she caused him not to follow the Lord. And, uh, and then again in chapter 21 and verses verse 15 to, to 17, where we read the account of that man called um, uh, Naboth, who, who, um, who had this vineyard that, that this king wanted. And Jezebel tells him how to get it. And it's a terrible, sinful, horrible way. And he listens to her. And he goes and he does it. And he gets into an awful lot of trouble because of that. Um, I think that what we need to, to realize is that Job didn't listen to his wife. We also need to note that he didn't actually call her foolish. He said, you're speaking like one of the foolish women. He didn't say, you are a, a, a foolish woman. He said, you're starting to sound like one. So I'm just warning you. I think that he understood, as we need to understand, that she was a mother who tragically lost 10 of her children suddenly and without warning. And she was distraught with grief. She was suffering intense pain. And she spoke these words when she said, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But that was anger speaking. That was hurt speaking. That was pain speaking. That wasn't really the wife that he knew. And so he said to her, you speaking as one of the foolish women would speak. This is not in character with you. This is not the way I know you. And then he says to her, he says, just remember one thing. We've received an awful lot of good from God. And now, shall we not receive evil as well? And then, of course, this wonderful, wonderful phrase. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And this reminds me of what James says in James chapter 3 and verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man and able also to bridle his whole body. And this is where I want to end today with that challenge. Let's be people who learn to control what we say. Let's be people who ask God to put a God as David did, a God on our lips. So that we will, we will be able, if we can control our lips, then we are told that's a complete person. That's a complete man. And this is what we're aiming to be. This is what we want to be. If we're able to bridle our tongue, James says, we'll be able to bridle our whole body. If we can control what we say, we'll control all that we do. So let's just ask the Lord to help us in this way. Father, we thank you for the incredible testimony of this man, Job. We thank you for 
this wonderful wife that he had. And in spite of the fact that we read of a particular breakdown, a weakness here, a bit of failure over here where she said something which she should not have said, we just reminded that we're all doing we're all doing this all the time. Help us, I pray, to guard what we say, so that we might not only be able to control our words, but control our whole bodies. Be with us all, one and all, especially at this time, where we're so challenged by many things that we're not used to and that are difficult for us to understand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Uh, next time, I'm going to deal with the voice of associates. We're going to talk about Job's three friends. And if we have time, I'll speak about the voice of the afflicted. Although I should imagine that that will be a separate uh, study completely. Where we just have a look at Job's initial reaction to this intense suffering that he had. Thank you. Have a great week. God bless you all. Amen.